Habib has redefined what is possible in the sport of MMA. His record is ridiculous. How did he do it? What are the secrets to his incredible wrestling and grappling and what can we learn from him? And I want to frame Habib's success in terms of advantage and disadvantage and the many different levels on which that takes place. What does this mean? I'll break it down on six different levels of a fight. The meta slash skill level, the positional level, the weight level, the joint level, the cellular level, and the last mystery level that just most people aren't aware of at all. Advantage and disadvantage mean something very different at each level of this, but what they all share is simple. If you're in a fight, you want to give yourself every advantage you can and disadvantage your opponent in every way you can. That's accumulatively how you're gonna win that fight. Often on all six of these levels, Habib succeeds in doing this. I'll start from the top and work my way down. So to begin the meta slash skill level, at this level, how does Habib win the advantage war? To understand this, let's look at strikers versus wrestlers broadly. Strikers like to be on their feet. They're almost always standing and striking. But this is a skill, the skill of standing, stabilizing the body well from the waist downwards. They're often naturally very skilled at this subset of movement and get even better at it through lots of hours of practice. Glute usage, weight balance, rotation, acceleration, directional changes on the feet, etc. A fighter like Sean or Izzy comes to mind for doing this particularly well. Now, other body parts do matter, but they're used in particular ways. The torso is often kept in a fairly fixed position. It isn't often moved dynamically. It's mostly used as part of their kinetic chain, you know, transferring power from the ground up through their legs and feet to the relatively fragile arms and hands or whatever's hitting the opponent. Basically, strikers are great at the skill of standing. And so the goal for Habib at the meta skill level is to take this advantage away from them, to literally take them down onto the ground where they can no longer use this skill, effectively removing their ability to move at a high level. Because although Habib can stand and strike fairly well and improved a lot later in his career, he really has an entire other subset of skills that strikers often never learn. The ability to stabilize the torso extremely well from the belly button up essentially the foundation of having a good ground game. And this is about using mobile, dynamic, upper torso movements, often with the arms, hands, or something other than the feet as the reference point for power output. It's as distinct from striking as rock climbing is to sprinting. And doing both well is about as rare as doing sprinting and rock climbing to an elite level. Habib utilizes these powerful, dynamic, upper body movements as the foundation for much of his success in grappling which I'll get into later, but at a meta level, he's just trying to bring people down into his world on the ground where he's more skilled. So let's go down to the next level, positional advantage and disadvantage. And Dustin was really right about how Habib wins on this level. Strong, I don't know if he's the strongest guy I've ever fought, but he's strong at all, they're all strong. Nothing overwhelming or, or that really surprises me. Raw strength is not how you win grappling exchanges. Obviously, a minimum baseline is required, but keeping people on the ground is about something much more fundamental than that. And one part of this is position. And when people think about advantage and disadvantage in a fight, they are often thinking about it at this literal positional level. Like in BJJ, for instance, being on someone's back has an obvious positional advantage element to it or like being in full mount. But there are much less obvious examples of this that are really important to pay attention to. For instance, earlier we talked about the difference in stabilizing from the waist down and the waist up. But it's worth mentioning that the waist down is actually just more powerful. Like sprinting on your legs is obviously just gonna be better than sprinting on your hands. And legs are just more powerful muscles, especially when the weight is on the forefoot. So if you maintain your leg power and the opponent is just on arm power, you are actually by default at a massive advantage. So Habib tries to exploit this difference whenever possible, which means keeping himself on his feet grounded through his forefoot and his opponents on their arms or back whenever possible. You can see this very clearly in standing ground and pound, but often just in a lot of his movements, he's trying to set this relationship up. But added to this, when people are in this grounded position, they're forced to use their remaining tools to try and get up, which often is their arms, which they are just actually not as good at using. And so strikers in particular will often get stuck in a feedback loop where once they're down, they don't really have the tools to effectively get back up. But more than this, when Habib is trying to maintain his leg advantage, he does this in another very interesting and clever way. When he can't maintain this foot advantage, he'll default to the next best option, using his knees. And he does this movement in particular very well using what I think is one of his biggest movement strengths, his ability to 
AD ducked his legs, bringing his knees together. He uses these big inner leg muscles to pull his knees together to generate stability and allow the transfer of power. This makes his knees into pseudo feet, allowing him to maintain a lot of the advantages of standing while kneeling. And I can't stress enough that doing this very well is super rare. Like most people, when you put them on their knees, will just kneel there, whereas he's doing a lot more with this position. Another positional thing that he's doing exceptionally well is rolling people onto the outsides of their feet. Legs can't do good leg stuff when they're in this position. The force lines just stop making sense. It stops people getting their feet into positions where they can apply force in a direction that's useful. Like, if you want to stand up, you want your legs pointing at the ground so you can apply force upwards. If they're sideways, applying force a lot sideways doesn't really work because that's not a useful direction and there's nothing really to push against often either. And this isn't the only thing Habib does to feet, <laughs> not in a weird way. Um, and we'll look at that a lot more in the next level, the weight level. Force application in the leg largely comes from the forefoot. So if your weight is very far back on your heel, you can't use your forefoot effectively because the calf can't do anything to extend the leg. But more than that, the further your weight rests back on your foot, the harder it's going to be to get a good glute action. Test this for yourself. Just stand with your weight on your heels and on your forefoot and see how easy it is to use your glutes in either position. But basically the cumulative effect of all of these things is that if your weight rests too far back on your heels, it really damages your posterior chain's ability to output power. So if in fighting you can get people to have their weight further back on their heels, it can make it a lot harder for them to do anything effectively like resist takedowns or get up off the ground when they're down. And so keeping opponents literally on their back foot is one of the ways Habib utilizes weight advantage in a fight. And one of the easiest ways to do this and what you'll often see in his fights is that he maintains consistent forward pressure. Now, people can still keep their weight in the right place moving backwards in Counter-Strike effectively, but it is harder to do this. And so this is one of the reasons why Habib is nearly always moving forwards in his fights. And another obvious one is that if you want to shoot for a takedown, your weight needs to be moving forwards to do this. So you can't really shoot for a takedown when you're stepping backwards. And takedowns can be thought of another way in the context of weight. And again, Dustin got this super right. It's just his understanding of balance and weight placement was incredible, dude. Like, but he just knew where my weight was and where it needed to be for me to stay up with his foot trips. And, and uh... to take someone down, you have to know how they're upright, which is where is their weight resting and then how to destabilize that. This is really about a, a high level felt understanding and experience of weight, like how you support yours, where it goes when you move and how others do things. When Habib takes down Connor, he gets underneath one of his hips and lifts. This initially breaks someone's connection to the ground. Then as Connor tries to reconnect to the ground when his foot comes down, Habib simply, <laughs> I say simply, trips Connor as he's landing where his weight is landing before Connor has a chance to respond. He knows which foot is coming down as he's lifting the opposite one and he knows when it's coming down as he's holding and feeling the other person's weight. He utilizes these same principles in many of his other tripping takedowns and honestly these are just beautiful to watch. He knows exactly when and where a person's center of gravity is coming down to their foot and trips it the moment that it lands there. And when people are taken down, weight is utilized in a different way. Somewhat obviously when someone is on top of you, you're literally carrying their weight and thus the person underneath is usually doing more work to support that. But what's significant is the way in which he's achieving this outcome. Part of this is just trying to keep the weight of the opponent's torso back behind their legs. This is almost going to guarantee that their weight isn't on their legs properly at all, or if it is, it's on their heels where they can't effectively apply force from this position. Also on a more general meta level here, he's getting his entire body to act as one stable lever applying force to a person, either as one long lever or an connected shortened form, like when he's applying force from his knees. Like the opposite of this would just be separate bits of the body applying force, like just an arm extending trying to keep someone down. That's not really an effective tool compared to the weight of a person. There is a lot of nuance in the way he perpetually keeps his weight in the right place, pinning his opponent underneath him. He's using it like a weapon to keep someone completely trapped. If you've ever grappled with someone much better than you, you know this feeling for sure. It's just constant pressure. None of the movements you do are helpful. There is no space at any point that allows you to adjust or move upwards, it's just further down. And he's doing this through near perfect connection of movement. The weight is constantly on the opponent. It's super high level and breaking down this aspect of his movement alone is basically an entire other video. So for now, the concept is the important thing to grasp. 
Up next is advantage and disadvantage on the joint level, which I think is the second most misunderstood of the levels. Let's start with an easy example to illustrate the principles here. Let's look at the knee joint and the quad muscle. So imagining that you're trying to do your maximum force leg press. If you're doing this movement and starting with a completely bent leg, it's going to be much harder than if you are starting with your leg already at 90 degrees. This is positional disadvantage. The position is making it harder for you to use your quad muscle. The quad is just the quad. The muscle isn't changing. The position is just worse for applying force. And it's also true to say that it's disadvantaged when it's completely straight because it can't actually push from here either. So in a fight context, in terms of the knee joint, perfect advantage for yourself would be keeping your knee at around 90 degrees and perfect disadvantage for the opponent would be either keeping their knee completely bent or completely straight. Now all joints and muscles in the body function this way. They have ideal positions where they're at their strongest and non-ideal positions where they're at their weakest. So Habib is looking to exploit this whenever possible. So for instance, in a takedown, he's always trying to ensure that the opponent is in forced knee flexion, keeping the knee joint as bent as possible. He's doing this through position and weight and lots of other stuff, but the goal he's looking for is the person's knee joint to be disadvantaged. His super adductors from earlier serve another important function in terms of joint disadvantage. He squeezes with them, wrapping up his opponent's legs. This is the Habib special. This is effective for quite a few different reasons. Really straight legs are just as positionally disadvantaged as really bent legs. You can't use them to stand up with. But crucially, he also internally rotates his opponent's legs as he does this. Leg rotation is actually extremely hard to deal with, perhaps even harder than the flexion extension balance on a joint. There aren't actually a lot of super powerful external rotators at the hip joint, so if you can trap someone in this internally rotating movement, it's extremely hard for them to get out of. In the context of arms, this is why the Kimura is a submission. Once the arm starts internally rotating, the more internally rotated it gets, the harder it becomes for it of its own means to uninternally rotate itself. And this leg rotation really functions in a similar way. You end up having to use some kind of other means to get out of it, like arm power. But the accumulative effect of this is that Habib is disadvantaging his opponent's legs in as many different ways as possible throughout the course of the fight. And not just legs, but every joint in the body he's playing this game at. And the accumulative effect of this plays out on the next level, the cellular level. The more a muscle tries to work from a disadvantaged position, the harder it has to work to achieve the same or worse a movement outcome. And so the accumulation of all of the above strategies results in literally cellular muscular exhaustion for the person trying to oppose him. And this happens in the key muscle groups that people need to get themselves upright, like their quads. And so the longer the fight goes, it gets progressively more difficult for his opponent to surmount his weight because he's getting more and more tired faster and faster. But not only that, because his positions are so much more advantaged, he's effectively using less energy to do the same thing. It's just so much more efficient. He's maximizing the potential capacity of these much more powerful muscle groups from better positions. And even if cardio were even, which it may well not be, the longer the fight goes, the more likely Habib is going to win by just pure fatigue. You can really see this in the Dustin fight. This may be the most tired I've ever seen Dustin. He's constantly fighting from the most disadvantaged positions with disadvantaged joints and disadvantaged muscles. Like, unless he gets really lucky with one punch early in the fight, I just don't see him beating Islam. Sorry, Dustin, I love you, but... And now last, the perhaps most misunderstood and mystery level, the postural level. What does this mean and why does it matter? And this is, in my opinion, the true best base for MMA. Why? Every position you're in at all times, whether it be fighting or in daily life, is either advantaging or disadvantaging a muscle through position. Good posture just means being in the most ideal position to begin with. Like, there's no point starting a fight from an already disadvantaged position. E.g. the typical head forward posture you see a lot of the time is just terrible. It's asking for an early knockout or a guillotine finish because so many of the head and neck muscles are just disadvantaged by default. But this is only one of countless examples of how you could pre-disadvantage yourself. A relevant example of this is Gaethje's chest position. He's posturally disadvantaging his pec muscles. And this isn't really an issue with, you know, a big overhand right hand or whatever, but it is a big issue when you're trying to push yourself up off the ground or just use your arms effectively in grappling. Just look at Habib for comparison. His pecs are popping. This guy can arm. If you want to learn about this in significantly more detail, I'm currently writing an ebook about improving your posture. 
Click the link in the description to sign up to the mailing list if you're interested to get this when it comes out. Or if you're in the future, get it now, it's a total banger. Now this isn't an invitation to comment on this video saying, well, what about fighter X's posture? There really is so much more that could be said about this. It's its own entire video, which may come at some point in the future. Anyway, with those six levels covered, here's another hot take for you. I think probably wrestling is a much better base for MMA than striking. If your base is striking, it's probably just never been required of you in the same way to learn the upper torso stabilization and movement skills that you need to grapple well. Finding someone who can truly excel at both is super rare, which is one of the reasons why I think Islam is probably going to be on the top of this division for quite a long time. Not to mention that his striking is probably better than Habib's ever was too. So my advice, if you want to be more like Habib, is start wrestling BJJ Sambo, whatever ASAP. Hell, even rock climbing or b-boying, anything. You just need to learn to feel as connected, grounded and strong and mobile and dynamic through your upper torso as you do through your lower torso. I'd also recommend watching my other videos, in particular the one about climbing. These skills cross over very well with grappling. And sign up to the mailing list and or buy my book. Anyway, thanks for watching guys. I really appreciate the continued support. Up next, I'm probably gonna make some videos that aren't about fighting, but watch them. I promise you will learn things, they'll be good. Peace out.